Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh. Uh, I guess the first thing I want to do tonight is uh, to thank you all for coming out, despite the fact that I'm from the United States. Uh, traditionally, my people are kind of um, buttholes. And so, uh, yeah, thank you for coming out despite that. Um, so tonight, I'm actually going to uh, start by making a somewhat ridiculous proposition, um, uh, which is that I want everyone in this room to consider uh, planning, uh, participating in, and eventually actualizing a revolution for non-humans, for the bioregion in which you live, and ultimately for the freedom of all humans. Um, that's a very difficult proposition to make, and it's not something that I make lightly. Uh, revolution is not um, a term that uh, should be romanticized. It's something that people uh, starve for. It's something that people die for. It's something that people um, have been tortured in prison for, something that they long for forever and that is sometimes kept from them. To ask somebody to consider taking on such a task is a somewhat monumental thing. And so uh, I know that if I were sitting in the audience, I'd probably want to know a little bit about the person who is asking it uh, of me. So I suppose tonight um, I'll probably begin by uh, just talking a little bit about uh, who I am and uh, where I came from. Um, I was born in a, a very large city in Southern California in 1975. Um, my mother was a factory worker in a frozen foods warehouse that made uh, frozen pizzas. Um, my father was a uh, sometimes auto mechanic, but more often a small time drug dealer. And uh, I had a sister uh, named Alita, who is probably the most precious person to me on earth. Uh, and she was born with um, several disabilities and autism. My father was in the Vietnam War. And while he was there, he was a tank driver. Uh, one day, while he was uh, clearing an area of jungle uh, using his tank, he was also um, smoking a joint and a seed inside the joint popped and a little piece of flame fell down onto some munitions and exploded inside the tank and lit it on fire. Uh, three quarters of his body were uh, covered in third degree burns and pieces of shrapnel became lodged in his skull. When he reached the hospital, they were unable to operate and remove the shrapnel and so it calcified inside of his head and it meant that he was essentially uh, in constant pain. And oftentimes that meant that he was uh, lashing out uh, at my family. Uh, he was a very angry person. From a very early age, I had this constant dichotomy in my home between those who are powerful and strong, my father, uh, and those who are not, my sister. From a very early age also, uh, I picked up one trait that um, that I think has really led me to become ultimately who I am, and that's um, that I hate the fucking police. Um, <laughs> um, my dad, having come out of a somewhat countercultural period in the 1960s and 1970s, happened to look very different. I remember one day we were going for a walk in San Diego on the Ocean Beach Pier, and there were two police officers who came over and began humiliating him and shaking him down in front of his family uh, just because of his hair. Even at that young age, there was something about authority that always rubbed me wrong and that always seemed negative to me and that always seemed like something that humanity should eventually overcome. Um, anyhow, when I was about nine years old, pardon, when I was about nine years old, um, one day, my father pulls up outside of my school in a brand new uh, van um, that I, I had never seen before. And um, I didn't know why, but I, I was getting taken out of school early. Uh, I was told at the time by my parents who were in the van and everything's packed and ready to go. Uh, 
I was told that uh, we were going on an early vacation and we were going to drive cross country. And it was only many, many, many years later I found out that we were actually running from my father's drug debts and uh, had to get out of town fast. Um, eventually, we landed in a small town called Eugene, Oregon. Ending up in Eugene, this area that is surrounded by beautiful green spaces and grasslands and wetlands, uh, lakes and rivers, uh, that on one side is surrounded by the Cascade Range and then uh, further to the west, oceans. Uh, it was such uh, a striking difference from this cement wasteland that I grew up in in Southern California. Southern California, San Diego, Los Angeles, the lights are so bright, thank you. <laughs> the lights are so bright that they block out the stars at night. Uh, but yet suddenly here I am in Oregon and you see all this majesty in the sky. There were all these species of animals that I had never seen before, like great blue herons, there were silver foxes. Um, and also because here I am and I'm turning 10, 11, 12, 13, this was a period that I was trying to define myself separately from my parents. And so as a poor kid, you know, I don't get to go away for summer camp. I'm not out taking like skydiving lessons. It was me and my friends uh, trying to hang out in the forests in the area around Eugene, uh, just going camping. These were the places that I found some of my best friends. They were the places that I had my first kisses and began to uh, really discover who I was. Of course, Oregon was an area where one of the biggest industries happened to be mining and logging. And so these areas that I was finding myself and loving so much, at a very young age, I started to see them falling to chainsaws. And what's worse, I started to see them getting paved over. And once paved, you have this sense that they are never going to come back. These places were a part of me and they were a part of my heart and it hurt so badly to see them go. Eventually, by the time that I was 15 years old, I had decided that I needed to come to a better understanding of the political situation around me. And so I started to read a little bit but more, I was listening to the lyrics of the punk and hardcore records that I was finding at a, a local shop. Uh, it was around that time that I decided to go uh, vegetarian, and also it was around that time that this really bizarre turn of political events happened in my state um, that were heading towards something that I saw even at that young age as borderline fascism. There was an organization called the Oregon Christians Alliance, and they had had quite a bit of success in the state um, passing these local level city ordinances that actually legalized discriminating against people on the basis of their sexual preference. It made it so that these small towns, uh, especially in the eastern part of the state, um, were allowed to fire teachers because they were homosexual um, or not hire somebody for your business because they were transgender. Um, this, because of the success of this organization and the numbers that they were building, neo-Nazi skinheads had started to pour into the state because they saw an area that might now be ripe for recruiting. Um, and so me and my friends at this age, you know, we're punk rock kids, we're very rebellious, we're getting politicized, and we wanted to do something about what was going on. Um, first, I joined an organization called Coalition for Human Dignity. They were one of the main voices trying to stop what was now a statewide initiative by the Oregon Christians Alliance uh, to essentially illegalize homosexuality in the state. Um, right after the offices of this group started, it was firebombed by neo-Nazis. Um, shortly after that, I remember uh, me and my friend Joe, who was the, the singer in a local punk band, uh, we were walking down by the university in Eugene, uh, the University of Oregon, and we saw uh, an Oregon Christian Alliance rally going on. They're there holding their, you know, their signs and spewing their vitriol. 
And um, I remember I kind of looked over at Joe. I'm like, we got to do something. We got to confront them. And, and so we walk up, and we don't really know what we're going to do. And, uh, and when we get right up in front of them, I just embraced Joe. And we had this wonderful, deep kiss. And in that moment, I'm like, oh, man, I'm half gay. Um, which was a revelation because I hadn't quite figured it out before that. Uh, and anyway, we had this great moment and we were able to piss off all the Oregon Christian Alliance people and they were shouting at us and we we're flipping them off and giving it right back. And we walked away very happy with ourselves. But what we didn't know was that we were being followed um, by Nazi skinheads. We split up on an area of, uh, of this street called East 13th. And I remember Joe walked towards um, uh, this hospital directly across the street while I decided to head down this alleyway behind a convenience store. And it was there that the skinheads jumped me and beat me to the ground and began stomping on me and kicking me in the head and the ribs and stepping on my hands. And they broke my fingers and they left me bruised and bloodied and they kicked me in the kidneys till I was pissing blood in the alley. I wanted so badly to just go home and to be protected and to feel uh, like I was able to escape this, but my father was a horribly homophobic man uh, who had warned me many times during my youth that if I ever turned out to be queer, he was going to disown me. So I waited until very, very late at night um, because I wanted to make sure that he was going to be asleep. And I crept across town, aching and bleeding. And by the time I reached home, uh, there was a doorway that led uh, into our kitchen. It was the one that was more secluded and the one I thought he would be less, less likely to detect me entering. Um, and I walked into the kitchen. And from, a, from across that door, we had a, a sliding glass door with sort of a, a back deck. And my father was on the back deck, and he was beating my dog, Max. And there was a very important shift in my thinking in that moment, because here was Max on the ground getting beaten as I had just been moments before. Now, I knew that Max couldn't speak my language. I knew that he didn't have the level of human intelligence that I had. He couldn't do geometry or program a computer. But none of that mattered. His level of intelligence was irrelevant because his ability to suffer was just the same as mine. And watching him try to escape that humiliation reminded me of the humiliation that I myself had just been put through moments before. Suddenly, non-humans were no longer there for me to enjoy the taste of their flesh or to enjoy the feel of their skin uh, as shoes or a jacket. Suddenly, I realized that these creatures were individuals with the same sorts of desires that I had, uh, who most certainly wanted to be free from suffering, if nothing else. The idea that I would attempt to take from them their freedom and their lives became absurd in my mind in just a split moment. And I started to feel more and more that this was something that I could no longer participate in. After that, my level of political activity began to increase. And eventually, when I was 19 years old, I moved to a, a town called Portland, uh, which I guess is sort of famous now as um, a stronghold for um, hipster jerks in the series uh, Portlandia. Um, when I first arrived, I got this horrible job. I, I worked at, a, uh, I worked at a, um, a hotel parking garage, and I had to wear this, um, this really like uh, heinous polyester shirt to work every day that had this big golden embroidered M on it uh, for the, the hotel's name, which was the Mallory. And I had to wear slacks and, uh, and go there every day dressed in this manner that I would never have otherwise chosen to dress. Um, 
I found this uh, apartment in the most like sort of wealthy area of the city, uh, but it was very, very cheap because it was above the boiler room and stayed at about a constant 103 degree temperature. And uh, the entire building had these big picture windows, uh, but mine let out onto um, a storm wall. There was just a, a cement wall right on the other side. So I managed to get the apartment for very cheap. But being a punk kid, I had sort of a devil horn haircut at the time. I'm wearing this like heinous uniform. Uh, I didn't quite fit in in the neighborhood where there was all these like posh, high fashion people walking around. Um, but pretty soon I, I met another resident in the neighborhood who was, um, pardon, even a little bit more out of place than me. As I mentioned, logging was very big at this time in Oregon. Um, and just on the outskirts of the neighborhood in which I lived, they were beginning to clear an area of forest in order to build condominiums. Um, it was causing all of the creatures who lived in that area to begin to wander down into the main part of the city. And so uh, there's this very fuzzy uh, species of mouse called deer mice. Um, and I, one day as I was walking past this stone wall about a block from my house, I saw a deer mouse trying to make a nest in the rocks. And she looked so frightened and so scared of what might happen to her. And every time somebody walked by, she would press herself against the walls and try to hide. Over some time, as I began to continue to watch her and attempt to bring her some food and get her to, in some way, uh, notice me and this affinity that I strangely felt for her, um, she began to get more bold. Uh, people in my neighborhood wanted charismatic wildlife. They didn't want mice or rats or pigeons. They wanted songbirds and hummingbirds. Uh, and so there would be bird feeders hanging everywhere outside of shops and from people's windows. And I would see her climb up and gather the seed in her mouth and run back down to her wall. Um, she became bolder and bolder. I'd see her climb trees and sort of set and people watch during the day. Um, one day I was coming back home from work and walking near the, the wall that she lived and I, I noticed a, a woman wearing fur. Um, by this time I was already starting to become a little bit more familiar with um, animal rights arguments and so I thought I'd walk up and begin to confront her about wearing uh, animal skins. And um, as I began to approach, uh, I started to overhear the conversation she was having with the woman she was speaking with. And she was saying, I can't believe this. You know, we pay so much for rent here and we've got rats living in our neighborhood. And so I, I walked up and I said, oh, I, you know, I, I see this, mice, this mouse every day and, and she's not harming anyone. We got into this back and forth argument and she was yelling at one point and started spitting towards me. Uh, I don't know, eventually it ended and I walked home. I didn't think much of it. The next day I went to work and when my shift was supposed to be ending, um, my replacement did not show up. I ended up working 16 hours straight and as I was walking home that night, I had long since forgotten the conversation that I had the day before. As I was walking past the deer mouse's uh, uh, wall, I noticed that there were yellow rat poison pellets uh, along the ground. So I began to frantically search around for her. And eventually I found her crawling uh, through the muck in this parking lot. I didn't know what to do, so I gathered her up in a box and I thought I might be able to help her. So I went into a store and I didn't know what she could eat. So I just got water and I got corn chips and I walked down the street to this park and let her out of the box. And I was trying to feed her and, and give her some water, but she was dying. And I remember looking into her eyes and just seeing this question, you know, why? Like, why is this happening to me? And um, once again, there was this shift in my thinking. Certainly, I had by this time stopped eating animals. I had stopped directly participating in their suffering. But I realized that that by itself was not enough. 
my own abstinence from a thing was not enough to allow me to ignore the fact that it was still happening on a massive scale. Um, after that night, as I sat there and watched her die and buried her in that park, I knew that I had to become more active for animals and I dived in full force. It was only a few weeks later that I had my very first arrest for animals. Um, and I began doing civil disobedience on a regular basis. Within the first year, I'd been arrested eight times. I started traveling across the country in order to go to demonstrations and to meet like-minded people. I was always out on a corner somewhere holding a sign or passing out a leaflet. Um, and this continued on until, um, uh, until June 20th of 1998, um, which was the moment where, once again, I had another shift in my thinking. There was uh, a lot more trade publications for the vivisection industry at that time because it was, for the, it was before the very popular use of, uh, of the internet. So everything was still sort of in magazine form. And in one of these publications, we had found um, an advertisement for a breeding facility for uh, Florida white rabbits who were being sold into the vivisection industry. It was in a tiny town called uh, Philomath, Oregon. Um, we didn't know where the farm itself was because there was never any address given in these advertisements, only a P.O. box. And so what we had to do was go to this post office and just sit and watch the box all day long, waiting for someone to eventually come up and check the mail. We worked in shifts while the thing was open, and finally one day um, somebody saw somebody go up and check the box, pull some envelopes out and go out to their car. They ran and they followed them, and that person led them right back to the farm. So we began to plan a demonstration at that time against the farm, and we wanted to make sort of a splash. We'd noticed that in England at the time, there had been a lot of success for animal rights activists who had begun to go after breeding farms. Um, so we called upon activists from California, and we called upon activists from Washington, Utah, all the nearby states to come out and join us on this demonstration. We figured that it would be like most of the demonstrations that we organized around that time, uh, that essentially we would arrive, we would be outnumbered by the police, we would sort of stand there and be filmed by the media, um, maybe do some chanting and eventually go home. But much to our surprise, when we showed up, there were no police there at all. And there was nobody on the farm. And there were no lights on in the farmhouse. And I remember I was standing at this gate that led down, uh, that, that, sorry, blocked a, a gravel road that led down to the sheds where the rabbits were. And I could hear them moving around and I could smell them. And all of a sudden I had this sense that this is no longer an abstraction. In the animal rights movement, so often we turn animals uh, into a representation, a thing, their photographs on a leaflet or their numbers and the statistics that we use. But it's very rare that we begin to see them as an individual. I was staring down that gravel driveway and this thought hit me like, what does it say about me if I don't jump over this fence? I know what's going to happen to each and every last one of those rabbits. I've seen the videotapes, I've read the books, I know what happens in vivisection labs. They are right there, I could go get some of them out. Um, I didn't want to put other activists at risk, and so I turned and, and I kind of announced to everyone, like, I'm, I'm going to go try and take some of these rabbits out, and, you know, I, I understand that that's dangerous, so if anyone wants to leave, like, I get it, feel free, you know, go ahead and go, uh, but I, I can't just stand here. And to my surprise, many other people began jumping over the fence. Nobody left. Everybody was waiting and in some way helping. We ran down to the cages. We began to pull the rabbits out and run them back up the gravel driveway and pass them to other activists across the fence who were then running them down and taking them to cars. Um, I remember fleeing the scene that day 
And I had this rabbit who, who I eventually uh, named Notch here, and I was holding him against my chest, and I could feel his heart rapidly beating against mine. And there was this sense that the only thing that had stood between him and a horrific death uh, was my presence. And suddenly the concept of animal liberation became uh, a much less philosophical thing. It became something that was solid and real and in the moment, something that be, could be con, uh, that could be done directly. This was something that was a matter of direct intervention by humans, something that we could be doing nearly every day, and why weren't we doing it? The thing is, is that that day, I was a young man, and I was very cocky, and I was very arrogant, and after a lifetime of being a super nerd whose main interests were Dungeons and Dragons and comic books, Suddenly, everybody knew that I had taken part in this liberation because people had come from states away. I had no mask on. Everyone knew that I was responsible. It was this very beautiful moment in the history of my activism, but in many ways, it led me down a path that was very negative for the non-humans that I was advocating for because all of a sudden, I had recognition, and recognition sort of ruined me. Um, Suddenly people were paying attention to me and there was this aesthetic in the militant animal rights movement at the time that was hyper-masculine and, um, and militaristic and uh, quite frankly somewhat corny. I embraced it full throttle. All of a sudden I wanted to be the embodiment of the tough animal rights guy. And so having gone from this sensitive person who was motivated by this very soft spot in my heart who wanted to talk, talk to people from a, a place of kindness and get them to consider what they were doing to non-humans, I became this guy who had to wear like paramilitary pants to hold a sign. You know, I'd be standing on a corner passing out leaflets, wondering why no one wanted to approach the guy dressed as a bank robber, you know? Standing there in my balaclava that, I don't know why you need a balaclava to pass out leaflets, but when I was 22, I was sure you needed it. That was, that was a necessity, you had to fucking have that shit. So uh, eventually I did many other silly things. I got the words uh, vegan mafia tattooed on my shins. Uh, all the accoutrement of a total animal rights asshole in the 1990s. Um, unfortunately, the arc of, of my, uh, my uh, toughness phase happened to follow the arc of the animal rights movement in general. Back in 1973 in England, uh, there was a guy by the name of Ronnie Lee. And um, he'd been working as a garbage man, but he was studying to be a lawyer. Um, he had gone a vegetarian at a very young age, and then eventually his, um, his sister's boyfriend uh, who he met and had many similar interests in, began to tell him about veganism. And so Ronnie embraced, uh, embraced veganism. He lived in Luton, and Luton was the site of probably uh, one of the best hunt sabotage groups in the United Kingdom. So he joined up with them and began to go out and sabotage fox hunts on the weekend. But Ronnie was a sharp guy. You know, uh, people had been sabotaging these fox hunts for many years, and he began to look at the situation, and one of the things that sort of occurred to him was that fox hunts happen after the hunt begins, after they've already discovered the fox and began to pursue them. Even being pursued, being hunted, being chased, hearing the noise behind you, sensing death coming, that was a form of trauma. To allow the hunt to even begin, meant that, that these animals, whether or not you save their lives at the end of the day, were going to suffer horribly. And so one of the things that Ronnie did was he started to go to some of the other Luton Sabs, and he started to say, you know what, we need to form something that's more anonymous. We need to do something where we're going out beforehand and doing something to, to stop these hunts. There had been um, in the... Uh, in the um, uh, the world's oldest anti-vivisection organization, uh, the British Union to Abolish Vivisection, there had been a, a youth auxiliary that went by the name the Band of Mercy. 
And their name had its origins in this sort of legend in the United Kingdom that, that's probably mythological about the children of, um, of uh, 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 royalty sabotaging their parents' hunting weapons. Um, and so Ronnie decided that he wanted his new organization to also take on this name, the Band of Mercy. Um, they began to go out prior to hunts, and they began to uh, slash the tires of the vehicles that were going to be used. Um, they began to enter the buildings where the weapons were kept, and they began to um, pour cement down into the barrels and do other things that might sabotage the hunting weapons. Eventually, as this was continuing, they got the idea that you know, we've got this movement and it's building. We're beginning to think outside of, of just hunting. We're taking this direct action. Why don't we begin to consider utilizing it against other forms of animal abuse? And so it was at that time that they, be, they decided that they were going to carry out their first arson attack. And they went after a laboratory that was being built by Hoist Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they went in and they sat it on fire one night, uh, but it was sort of a disastrous night for them. Just deciding that you're going to take guerrilla action doesn't necessarily mean that you're suited for doing so. And as just everyday uh, common folks, they had no training whatsoever. And so in their haste, after they had left their fire bombs and had set them off, um, they went down uh, the stairs too far into the basement, and by the time they got back up, the entire building was in flames. As they went running across the floor to try and uh, get to the exit, their shoes were losing rubber on the ground. Uh, but they managed to get away, and then, much to their dismay, the fire caused very, very little damage and only was delaying the building of this laboratory by a few weeks. So they went back 10 days later with more gas and burnt the whole thing down. Good for them. At that time, Ronnie was very influenced um, by an organization in the United Kingdom uh, which was called the Band of Mercy. The Band of Mercy, uh, or sorry, not the Band of Mercy, the Angry Brigade. Um, the Angry Brigade was one of many uh, guerrilla groupings that had begun to sprout up in Western countries around that time, but they themselves were borrowing uh, or maybe even appropriating much of their imagery and style and rhetoric and aesthetic from third world liberation movements. These third world liberation movements, which were happening in places like Cuba, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, throughout South and Central America, in South Africa and elsewhere, were typically happening in places where people had been kept from power by military dictatorship um, or white supremacy, or colonialism, imperialism for a very long time. Because these people had been kept from power for so long and were up against opponents that seemed so monolithic, it somewhat made sense that the symbology of these movements would revolve around something that gave people a great sense of power. Guns, weaponry, red stars, flags, things that gave people some sort of sense of unification. It made some sense as well that the people who were writing the statements that these groups were, um, were putting out would show an air of bravado and confidence because they're trying to inspire a mass of people who never before have been able to really rise up in the face of what was going on. Um, as groups in the West began to support these movements, they began to develop guerrilla movements of their own and as I said, they started to take on the symbology. So when Ronnie was looking up to the Angry Brigade, he also began to take some of this aesthetic and he began, began to take on some of their rhetorical style. And once again, just like with me, this thing that had started out as coming from a very soft place in his heart, wanting to stop foxes from going through the fear and pain of being hunted, it started to become this other thing altogether, this thing that was about militarism, this thing that was about toughness, this thing that was about exuding sort of a hyper-masculinity. And so by the 1980s, the early 1980s in England, 
this movement that had begun to blossom, that had begun to, um, that had begun to have demonstrations of 5,000 people, that had begun to produce sort of a, a mass militant culture where groups like the Northern Animal Liberation League were invading laboratories with huge sections of the public, 3,000 people going in, taking out documents, taking out animals. It had also started to develop this other side altogether. Uh, that side uh, was mostly led by organizations with really corny, sur silly names like the Hunt Retribution Squad and the Animal Rights Militia. The names were sort of harmless enough. The imagery was hyper-militaristic, people holding baseball bats, uh, pickaxe handles, in some cases really ridiculous things like big rotary pavement saws. Um, that was silly and negative and the sort of thing that might turn the public away, sure, but it wasn't really as serious as what was to come, which was bombings. In one case, the animal rights militia placed bombs under vivisectors' cars in England. No vivisectors were harmed, but a six-year-old girl was blinded in one eye as she was out in the street playing on her bike. At the time, the ALF supporters group, um, by this time the Band of Mercy had changed their name to the Animal Liberation Front. The ALF supporters group, who had always taken a position that they were going to never harm any life, human or non-human, um, was writing articles telling people that they shouldn't freak out about this six-year-old girl being blinded. If you're coming from a place where you're concerned that foxes are in fear because they're being pursued by hunters, and yet you can justify the blinding of an innocent six-year-old girl, that to me is the perfect fucking time to freak out. That's the time where within a movement you have to say, no, wait a minute, this prevents us from doing what it is that we've set out to do, which to me is to build a critical mass of people a movement that can be supportable, something that can build enough in the way of numbers that it actually has a chance of toppling these massive, wealthy, entrenched, powerful animal industry interests. And it did happen. At that time in England, and, and this is one of those things that when I say people find very hard to believe, but I have the statistics on my website, there are over 400 direct actions happening every single night in the United Kingdom. 400 every single night. Now, many of these were small. It was spray paint. It was people putting um, glue into locks or slashing tires. But a lot of these uh, actions were much more serious. It was people breaking into labs. It was people going on the fur farms. Uh, it was people going in and stealing documents from uh, research society buildings. It was something that was causing such a massive threat to the industry that the British government began to follow thousands of people across the United Kingdom. They started a whole project out of Scotland Yard called the Animal Rights National Index. And by 1984, the animal rights movement was causing more financial damage every year in the United Kingdom than the IRA was. They were scared. They thought that this was something that might develop into a revolution. But thanks to what I might call now the cult of militancy, that's not the direction that it went. As the postal bombings began to increase, as the rhetoric inside of the supporters group newsletter became more about destruction, as it became more about this is between us and the scum, as it became more about um, sort of a, 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 an aggrandizing of the movement itself and talking about how powerful they were, how strong they were, the police were never going to stop them, they were at the top of their game. It became cartoonish and cult-like and bizarre and the public didn't know what to do with it. And those people who were involved in the movement who had come in from that soft place in their heart that had caused me to jump over that fence that night and caused thousands of others around the world to risk imprisonment in order to save the lives of a species other than their own, these people didn't know what to do with a six-year-old blind girl. They didn't want to be associated with it. And more and more, the movement in the United Kingdom began to recede. 
The path in the United States wasn't much different. And if you go back through old publications from around the world, including here in Sweden, you see this same militaristic rhetoric and you see this same uh, ugly aesthetic you see angry young men in balaclavas over and over and over. And what you don't see very often, surprisingly, in many of these publications, is animals, non-human animals. In the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, and prior to that in the movement for abolition, uh, for example, um, of course, white people had joined these movements but for a very good reason, they were not the face of these movements. Uh, the movement for suffrage and women's liberation, men participated in this struggle, yes. Should they have been the face of it? Absolutely not. And I think the reasoning for that is clear to all of us. And yet, within militant animal rights, more and more and more, the subject became about the people carrying out the liberations. It became about imagery that made them appear powerful, them posing with sledgehammers, them posing with bolt cutters, them breaking into laboratories, them cutting through walls. And while all of this may have felt somewhat inspirational, it was taking space away from the non-humans who, to my thinking, should have been the focus all along. So what can we do? How can we work towards, uh, once again, having a popular militancy? Something where there are tactics that are du duplicable, uh, duplicatable <laughs> um, by nearly anyone, where the tactics themselves can be difficult for the media to demonize, where the public might look upon these strategies and think, this is something that I could imagine myself doing something that might inspire people to build greater and greater numbers, something that might let us once for once reach the strength where we have enough people that these things can be toppled. Uh, to my mind, that opportunity has never, been, um, has never been greater. After what happened with the Shack campaign, uh, which is something that Linnea spoke about earlier, all across the 18 countries in which Shaq was present, and by that time, Shaq itself had become sort of the paragon of, of hyper-militarism in the, in the animal rights movement, um, people began to get arrested. There was this terrible repression, and I was one of the victims of it for two speeches that I gave in the United States about forms of hacktivism. Um, uh, things such as sending black faxes. We used a tactic called war dialing where you use a, a old computer modem to repeatedly bombard a phone number. Uh, we did things called SMTP bombing where uh, it attacks a computer's email server and so on. Not for utilizing those tactics, but for talking about those tactics. I received three years in federal prison by the time that I got out, much of the movement had seemed to once again recede. It was terrible at the time, but now I'm almost wondering if it's provided us with an opportunity. As these imageries of, uh, of uh, aggressive masculinity and angry young men and balaclavas have started to disappear from the movement, maybe now for once we're in a place where we're no longer carrying that baggage, where a new generation of animal rights activists can begin to become inspired by a movement that no longer uses images of us, but begins to talk about the lives of these animals, begins to talk about the fact that they are held behind bars, that they are incarcerated, that they never see sunlight, that their paws will never touch grass. We can begin to talk about not only the suffering that they go through, though, but that the lives that they live after liberation, this can be the face of our movement now. We can show people, for once, the difference between a life behind bars and now, liberation. And I think that that is the first part of the path towards creating a more popular militancy for animal rights. Um, I should, real quickly, I, I was warned earlier that the word militant might have a somewhat different meaning uh, in Sweden than it does in the United States. Militant in the United States is even sometimes used by pacifist organizations. Martin Luther King Jr., for example, used it. Uh, it's often meant uh, more as 
constant agitator, somebody who's always out, they're dedicated, um, they push and push and push for their, for their cause. We're in a, a pretty extreme situation on this planet right now. Uh, we're in the midst of a extinction um, where species are dying out at a rate greater than during the time of the dinosaurs. We're watching global warming and its effects hit us, and as droughts are happening across the United States and elsewhere, how far away are we from seeing ecological refugees? We're in a period where we have a government in the world that not only has a nuclear stockpile that can destroy the world like 10, 15 times over, but where that very same government has the technological capabilities to tap and record almost every conversation that happens online and on phones, where they're scanning the, uh, the front of every letter sent in the United States in order to capture the addresses and see who's writing to who. This is a situation that to me cries out for action, that demands that we all do something a little bit more. And more than that, it demands that what we do is intelligent. It demands that what we do doesn't uh, take people away from us, doesn't distract from the movements that we're trying to support, but rather inspires people and brings them in closer. I talked earlier about that moment that I was standing there at the fence looking down and wondering what it would say to me, say about me, if I chose not to jump. And I'm going to argue that tonight, all of us are standing at that fence. Thank you so much for having me. Um, do, we have, do we have time for questions and answers? I do. I, I think that, that one of the failings of so many movements is that people imagine that somehow there's going to be this one homogenous path that's going to lead us forward. And it's how you end up with all this like ridiculous sectarianism amongst like communists and socialist groups who somehow magically think that they're like, Trotskyist Maoist analysis is going to be the one that leads the revolution and that everyone's going to become a Trotskyist Maoist or something. Um, it's absurd. People come from all sorts of different viewpoints. Um, people come from all different sorts of, uh, of backgrounds that might lead them to take on different, uh, different ideas, different types of actions, to use different aesthetics and different rhetoric. And I think that all of that is fine. Um, I want to see a global movement. And of course, across the globe, uh, we have very many different cultures, very many different ideas. And that's going to mean that no one movement in one area, or even several movements in one area, are going to act exactly the same. In the animal rights movement, I'm not the first person to point out how unpopular it is you know, especially uh, uh, nowadays to see people in balaclavas looking angry, carrying around sledgehammers and such. Many people have tried to solve the problem of what do we do? How can we become more popular? How can we have a public face uh, that's a little less ugly? And so there've been things like live liberations, for example, where people go in and they don't use masks. In Italy and Brazil recently, we've seen uh, a return to the use of daylight raids where uh, people in the midst of large demonstrations begin to overwhelm the police lines and go in and directly remove animals. And these are things that the public can look upon in many ways and, and at least perhaps see themselves as somebody who might want to do that, and especially in the case of Italy where, um, where you had a charismatic animal, beagles, uh, being taken out of labs uh, by thousands of people who, who stormed Green Hill. I think that we're not going to see just one solution to the problem. I think many groups in many different areas are going to try different ideas. Some of those ideas are going to work, and some of them are not going to work. 
But by refusing to be acritical about the way that we're behaving, by beginning to confront our failures instead of just repeating them over and over and over again, and having a movement that's almost anachronistic that looks the same today as it did in the 1970s, um, over time we can begin to refine and develop these tactics. And um, I think that, yeah, we will have people who are on the more uh, militant edge and their rhetoric is going to be more extreme and they're going to use um, you know, uh, an aesthetic that is more controversial. And on the other end, we will probably have people who practice forms of direct action that maybe are nonviolent and pacifist and perhaps they're going to engage in uh, voluntary arrest. I think that's a good thing. I think that having a, a diversity of tactics means that our opponent never has the ability to simply, uh, uh, to simply guard against one form of attack. It means that they're going to have to plan for all different sorts of tactics, all different sorts of strategy, different groups, different individuals. It makes their job much harder. So yes, I think that we can have both. There doesn't necessarily have to be a dichotomy between one and the other. Are there any other questions? Right. I um, I I love to study other uh, other movements in the past, and guerrilla movements are are one of the movements that I often uh, enjoy reading about and uh, trying to understand their working. Expropriations, the idea that you're going to take money from the capitalist system and, uh, and return it for the purpose of liberation somewhere else has been utilized by a broad number of groups. Uh, in the United States, I think about the Black Liberation Army, Armed Action Unit, United Freedom Front, the George Jackson Brigade, um, Puerto Rican independence activists used it at, at a few points. Um, one thing that I've noticed about all of those movements is that they failed. Despite the fact that they were able to generate a large number of resources, all of them were constantly putting members of the public at risk. Uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army was one example. The George Jackson Brigade uh, ended up in a gun battle with police in the Seattle area, ended up shooting police officers and bullets wounded civilians that were in the area. Um, in the case of many of the groups uh, that used those tactics, people who were eventually caught uh, were sentenced to life in prison right now in the United States. We have, I believe, nine different members of the Black Liberation Army and Armed Action Unit um, who are still in prison 30-somewhat uh, years after their arrest. Of course, seeing people uh, doing that sort of time can be quite demoralizing. And so I don't quite know if that as a tactic is something um, that, really, uh, that really still has a place. However, bank robbery isn't the only way to generate money, and it's not the only way to generate money illegally. One of the things that we saw during the Shaq campaign, um, oh, I miss Shaq. I miss Shaq so much. Despite all of our mistakes, one thing I will say about us is that we really pushed hard. We had an end goal in sight, and we tried to throw every part of ourselves at it in order to achieve our goal. Um, there was this very wealthy man, Warren Stevens. He was a billionaire who ran the United States' um, uh, largest private uh, investment banking firm. And he was the largest institutional investor in Huntington Life Sciences. And he also was the owner of their loan debt facility, which basically meant that um, they owed millions and millions of dollars. He bought their debt so that they would have to pay a percentage on it, and he believed that eventually they would recover and he would make a profit. Um, somebody stole his identity, and at one point um, got credit cards in his name. And one of the things that they began doing was making massive donations to environmental and animal rights groups using um, American Express cards in his name. 
American Express doesn't have any spending limit. And so what that meant was is that groups like Greenpeace in many cases, um, they were getting these massive donations like $75,000 at a time or $50,000 or whatever. One of the really clever things that was done after they stole his identity though is that they decided they were going to give money to charities that like nobody could object to, you know? It was like, you know, save the starving children and, uh, you know, things of this nature so that by the time it was caught and he realized that his identity was stolen and that like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of his money, I think it was hundreds of thousands of dollars by the end, if he wanted to go back and tell these groups that they had to return it, he looks like a fucking asshole in the media, right? Like, ah, sorry, starving kids, I'm, let me just take that back. And so um, it was one of those things where he didn't quite know what to do about it, and he just sort of ended up taking the loss. Um, I know that, that the tactics that I primarily like to see these days are the ones that don't really require a lot of specialization of skill because honestly, most people don't have access to the, those types of skills, you know. Um, hacking is one of those things that while many people are able to learn, not everyone at a young age has access to the technology in order to be able to do it. Um, but it's interesting to think that perhaps this could be a way eventually. And I was in prison, I met so many identity thieves that were amongst the dumbest fucking people on earth that certainly if they could do it, I think we could do it as well. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? I do. Um, often, oftentimes in the animal rights movement, when I begin to say that, you know, basically, and this is difficult for me to say, um, but in many ways, groups like the Animal Liberation Front have, have failed. I mean, to say in many ways is almost dishonest. They have failed. They may have saved very, very many individual lives, and that's wonderful. But their initial goal, the goal that they talked about in all their early communiques, was to create a revolution for non-humans, to, to be able to overturn the entire system of our species' domination over every other species. And in that way, they've horribly failed. Um, so when I begin to, to critique this and when I begin to talk about this, one of the things that's often thrown out is, is open rescue. Um, open rescue is wonderful and, and I hope to see it continue. And for those who are attracted to it, um, more power to you. I personally have done prison time and I have no intention of ever going back. Um, I don't expect that it will ever be too popular of a thing either to advocate that other people willingly throw themselves into the arm of the prison industrial complex in my country, um, an area where going to prison uh, is often a horrific and violent experience. I think that there's always going to be a necessity for anonymous direct action. Um, oftentimes when I am critiquing the balaclavas, the masks, that imagery, uh, people get this sense that my critique is about balaclavas. I honestly don't care what people use to obscure their face. My point is more that that face should not be the focus in the media and uh, in our propaganda that we distribute amongst our, our, uh, our own movement. There is a need for anonymity. There is a need for people to be able to continue actions. And I'd say that there's no revolution that can take place without continuity. You have to continue to knock at the door. You have to continue to bang it down. And that's a very difficult thing to do if you're trapped in the courts and trapped behind bars. Anonymous movements also fall sometimes. Some people do end up getting caught. Um, you know, and earlier I mentioned the raids recently uh, in Brazil and in Italy and other places that would use what I call potentially anonymous direct action, uh, which is actions where there's such an overwhelming amount of people present that it's difficult for law enforcement to know which ones were participating. 
In those cases, of course, too, we see arrests. Whether or not people are guilty, oftentimes they're snatched up by the police and accused of having been the person who, who, who broke in. There's definitely going to be times that incarceration happens, but I do not want to see as a matter of course that every group that utilizes direct action is handing themselves over to the police. I have no interest in handing myself over to the police, and, and I don't expect many other people do. Does that, does that answer? <laughs> I rambled a little, so. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'm gonna stick around for an, uh, a while tonight. If anyone uh, has any questions that they'd rather ask one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be here. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it's been really wonderful to be in Sweden and to see all these wonderful activists. I drove here yesterday from, from Luxembourg with a, a van full of dancing crazy, crazy Swedish people. We listened to ABBA. It was awesome, so I'm looking forward to meeting more of you. Uh, thanks so much for having me.